Well, this was a few years ago, but one of the most outreach-oriented Christian pastors of the late 20th century had to be Bill Hybels, senior pastor at Willow Creek Community Church near Chicago. He and Mark Middleberg wrote a powerful bestseller entitled Becoming a Contagious Christian. It gives us a story that has some fascinating implications for our study of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. One of Heibel's staff members, also named Mark, who sometimes taught seminars on evangelism, unexpectedly ended up with two extra tickets to a contemporary music and drama presentation at Willow Creek Church. Another couple had canceled out on them, and now what should he and his wife, Heidi, do? Well, as he pulled into his own driveway, he suddenly noticed the young couple that lived next door to them walking by. Actually, they were living together next door and didn't exactly have a marriage license yet. They weren't much interested in spiritual things, but seemed like nice people. Mike had managed to learn their first names by now, so we called out to the man, Hey, Scott, I've got two tickets to a great concert tonight. Do you guys want to come? Then he had to admit, uh, it's at our church, quickly adding how contemporary and professional the program was, really not churchy at all. Well, instantly, you could see that the invitation was going to fall flat. The young couple just weren't quite ready to go to church. Scott stammered around and said, well, probably not tonight, maybe some other time. Then all at once he added, but if you two ever want to come over to our backyard for a barbecue, let us know. His neighbor's invitation hit Mike right between the eyes. It reflected the very principle he'd been teaching in his evangelism course. You can't drag people down to church right off the bat. First, you've got to barbecue. I confess that I'm about to redirect the moral to this story and his story. True, it was an experience designed to give established Christians some guidance on how to share their faith with non-Christians. You don't start out with an invitation to the 11 o'clock sermon. You first have to have a barbecue with them in the backyard and go to a Chicago Bulls game. That's the primary application, and it's a good one. But the idea of a progression of readiness also appears in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, then chapter 2, and now again here in chapter 3. 3. As Paul continues with his letter to the new believers in Corinth, he acknowledges that some of them aren't yet ready for the heavier spiritual experiences. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. That's 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 and 2. Now, as I previously said, there's nothing wrong with being a newborn Christian and needing a diet of milk. That's why God has given us milk in many forms. Bible stories are sometimes milk. The parables are simple and easy vehicles of truth. Many sermons and books have plain, straightforward style. On the other hand, there exists a tremendous amount of meat available for the Christian who's ready. Let's determine that by the grace of God, we will all seek some form of nourishment. We won't try to get by on a diet of air. Let me share just one reason. It is such a vital principle of the Christian faith. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16, Paul says to the fledgling church, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? Both here and over in chapter 6, we find the teaching that we as a people, as well as our bodies, are temples for God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit resides in us, or at least He wants to dwell there. At this very moment, it's His desire to live inside you. I have to confess that we've often used the passage to encourage people in the area of healthful living. No smoking, no drinking, no drugs, and so on. 
It's an absolutely vital principle, one that my own Adventist denomination has championed most effectively. But in a broader sense, the concept that our bodies are temples for God's Spirit ought to lead us to be extremely protective in all aspects of life. What do we watch? What do we listen to? What lifestyle do we choose? How much have we trained our minds to dwell on topics and themes that would be pleasing to our divine guest? Maybe you remember the beautiful yet hard as nails verse found a few pages over in Paul's letter to the Philippians in chapter four, verse eight. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. The progression from milk to meat, from easy to challenging, is a vital part of developing the Christian maturity to guard and protect that temple that is you. It takes some spiritual fiber to be willing to allow God to take out of our lives anything that might be destructive to the relationship we have with the indwelling Holy Spirit. Someone once asked a very painful question in their young adult Sabbath school class about protecting that body temple. When have you ever done something hard in order to obey God in this area? The teacher asked. Have you ever gotten up and walked out of a movie, turned off a television program halfway through? Returned a video you didn't watch all the way through? Been reading a book and decided you shouldn't finish it? Or thrown away a CD or cassette because its language in it didn't meet the standards of Philippians 4 verse 8? Maybe even traded in some old friends for new ones, if that's what it took. Some of those things jab pretty close to home, don't they? As we move from milk to food, as we seek to honor God by becoming mature and growing up. Will we act on the resulting convictions that come to us? That's the crux of it. Not just read, but do. Will we maybe even pack up and physically move, separating ourselves from sin in order to protect the growth process we're experiencing with Jesus.